So we usually keep one part of Shai uh, as a non-medical part, as purely non-medical. Uh, and we have at least one part of Shiloh which is non-medical where we directly engage uh, ourselves with what God's call is upon our life irrespective of our profession. Keep aside your medicine for a while, keep aside your nursing, your, your, your allied health uh, training for a while. But as a person, who is God calling you to be? And now is the time when we are going to enter into one, kind, one such kind of session which is, uh, which is issues facing young people today. And we have a very uh, dynamic, I'm going to take the liberty of saying, young person. He's got a few grey hairs, I noticed, but uh, I will still call him a young person. He must be younger than me, for sure. Uh, who's going to be talking about uh, what are issues that are facing young people today and what can we do about it. And those of you who have read uh, the few paragraphs about Duke Jairaj on our website will probably uh, be somewhat familiar. Many of you would have heard it before. I have not heard it before, so this is going to be my first time. So, Brother Duke, uh, over to you. Let's welcome him. Shall we close our eyes and ask God to speak to us? Even as we go into this subject, before us today, issues, struggles that young people today face. Gracious Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. Lord, when I dropped biology when I was an Ida Scudder School student years ago, I never in my wildest dreams imagined that I would be. One day, you would have it in your eternal plan that I would stand in this Scudder Auditorium speaking to wonderful people from the medical world here in this conference in Shiloh 2016. It is such a humbling privilege. It is an honor for me, Lord. We thank you for the wonderful people who have put together this conference of great magnitude and significance. And even as I preach your word, what your word has to say on the daily struggles and questions and issues that young people of our time, the Google generation, face. I pray the Holy Spirit will help me. I pray at the end of this message we will have a group of young people who will yield their body, soul, spirit, everything to you, surrender to you, surrender their lives to you 100%. Because a living daily relationship with you can help us handle any youth issue, any struggle of youth. We thank you. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Uh, we will begin by watching a video. Uh, this is from one of the most talked about uh, cricket games in recent times. So I want you to watch along and I will try to give you some commentary. Uh, and we will start off this session. They call it the greatest ever ODI play between New Zealand and South Africa. Chasing nearly, chasing 298 for a win in 43 overs. The last few minutes of that gripping game, which was, which some experts call the greatest ODI ever played. Okay, watch this. Field. You know, it's pure fielding. Stick different ground fielding on a slippery surface has been fantastic. So no rocking game, 23 from 13. And they've done it, Victoria could be out. Oh. Okay, as we watch this video, you know, you would find uh, there it goes. Quinton de Kock initially not catching the ball before whipping the bales. I guess that frame has gone already. And now the second one, okay, the second one, the ball is in the air. And the South African players break the fundamental rule of saying mine before going for a catch. Okay, that's the fundamental rule when of fielding. When, when a ball goes high, when there's a rocket up, you need to say mine and then go for it. They don't do that. The moment is big, the tension is big, and so they don't do that. And as the match wears on, 20 runs of 10 balls, 19 runs of 9 balls. Beautifully. Nice, nice, beauty. 
South Africa, great commitment, bad hamstring and all. Not now, maybe not now. Alan Hamilton, Harvard cover. Off cricket. 298 or 43 was the target. Okay, now this is, this is really sad because there we have two players. There we have Farhan, Behadrin and JP Dumini clashing where they had to take a sitter. Even a, that was a kind of catch which even my mother-in-law could have taken. You know? So, but, but you see what? They don't follow the basic rules, the basic laws of cricket. They don't say mine, they drop at 12 of 6. And uh, that was actually the guy, the guy who hit that rocket was Grant Elliott. If you know the end of the game, you would know that Grant Elliott hit a six when New Zealand needed five of two to win this semi-final for New Zealand. And New Zealand reached the World Cup final 2015. And post this game. Okay, that's the next ball is the last ball of this game uh, of this match. Five of two. And the ball goes for a six. Yeah, thank you. Now, after this game, we have these South African players almost in tears. It was as if their dreams were shattered, their life was shattered. It was the saddest day of their lives for several people. And they were in close to tears. I remember Moni Mokul almost weeping like a little baby, this tall, giant South African player. Now, what happened is, when the when the tension was big, they broke some very, very fundamental rules of cricket. Quinton de Kock did not collect the ball before whipping the bales. He tried to whip the bales before the ball came onto his gloves, and he missed a run-out chance of, of uh, Grant Elliott. And then this clash between J.P. Dumini as well as uh, 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 J.P. Dumini and Farhan Behadwin. They didn't say, it's mine. Now, that's what happens even in life, okay? The God who made you and me has got some uh, rules, laws. These laws have a negative connotation. These have negative connotation because of the hyper-grace movement. They have a negative connotation, uh, connotation because as young people, we don't like rules. But I want to tell you something. God has put in his word some rules. And if we will live by the rules, not with our own strength, enabled by the Holy Spirit, then our life will be truly joyous, truly fulfilling and truly rewarding. But if we will break these rules, you know, as I will mention during, at the end of this message, we will have a, we will live in a living hell and ultimately go to a little hell. And that's what this book proclaims. Every day, outside we would be bubbly, outside we would be joyous, outside we must be, we will be uh, cheerful, but inside we, are, we, are, we will be chained, inside we will be so sad, inside we will be, we will, be, we will feel torturous. And that, those are my opening comments as I begin this talk. Now, I want to bring a message from the book of, book of uh, Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 16. And I'm going to use Ezekiel 16 as a backdrop for us as we study on uh, issues facing young people today or struggles facing young people today. Ezekiel 16, I read from a version called the Wise Version, and if you are a lover of God's Word and you're looking for a contemporary good English version of the Bible, the Wise is one version I would recommend, a good contemporary English, uh, and it is done by a team of scholars. Okay, most of the references I'll be reading is from the Wise Version, and we will spend time in Ezekiel 16. That will be the backdrop for us as we launch into the study of youth issues and youth struggles in the life of the Bible. And at the beginning, I want to let you know that that chapter in the Bible, as does many passages of the Bible, it tells us that God loves us. It God, God loves us. You know, uh, the Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 16, 4 to 6, and all this is, uh, this is what, the, uh, uh, what is true of the city of Jerusalem, is true of each one of us. When you were born, nobody cut your umbilical cord. And we from the medical world understand that. A baby is born, the first courtesy ex, you know, offered to a baby born in this world is done by those in the medical profession and the doctors in the surgery room cut the umbilical cord. So this baby, has, the umbilical cord itself was not cut. No one took care of you. You were not washed with water and purified. I remember being in Rainbow Hospital in Hyderabad. And on November 12, 2007, when my wife delivered my daughter, only daughter, Natasha, 
and the doctors were kind to allow me inside the operation theater. It was a C-section operation. I was standing behind my wife's head. There was something like a, a, a bed sheet or something like that blocking my, uh, blocking uh, uh, the, me from the operation view, but I could still see most of the things that was happening. And the doctor fished out uh, a slimy, silvery, you know, bundle of joy from my wife's stomach, and, and then they took my daughter for washing. And the Bible says in Ezekiel 16, you know, this baby was not washed with water, nor purified, nor were you rubbed with salt, nor wrapped for warmth. No one felt sorry for you or had compassion on you or did anything to help you. Instead, your parents abandoned you, tossed you out in the open field. How cruel, how sad. It is a picture of a person who is utterly loveless. A person who has never experienced love. If you're sitting here in this auditorium thinking, does anybody love me? Does anybody care for me? Does anybody understand me? I have good news for you, sir. I have good news for you, madam. And this Bible says that God loves you. God has a deep concern for you. God loves you very much. He loves you with an everlasting love. And this passage, Ezekiel 16, 4 to 6, is a pictorial way of saying how much he cares for you and even if you feel that nobody cares for you if you think everybody has abandoned you my own, I want to tell you that God loves you and he cares for you there's another truth that comes from Ezekiel 16 and that is that we have sinned against God Ezekiel 16 15 in fact you must read 7 to 15 it's a long passage but I want to go on to verse 15 and it says, but you trusted in your beauty and you used your fame to become a whore, become a prostitute. You slept with every man who was simply passing by. So this, you know, this baby was tossed in the open field and then God walks in and says to the baby, live. The baby was in a, in a slimy, uh, slimy substance. It was in wallowing in blood. But God washed it. God cleaned it. God said live. And then the passage says how this God blessed this baby with everything. This baby became a fine young woman. And then when she became a fine young woman, you know, full of shape, full of beauty and full of everything a young woman wants you know the bible says in ezekiel 16 15 you became famous among the nations it's actually god is speaking about jerusalem but he's also speaking about you that's the view of the bible what can be what god says about jerusalem also can be also can be true about you and me uh, modern day believers he's, he says you you became a beautiful woman you carried yourself as a queen you became famous among the nations for your extraordinary beauty, beauty that flourished only because I lavished my splendor on you. But you trusted in your beauty and used your fame to become a prostitute and you slept with every man who was simply passing by. Now I want to tell you that over a hundred times in the Old Testament, this book uses the imagery of, uh, of adultery, of whoredom, of prostitution to describe how the people of God sinned against God over a hundred times. It's a very, very popular image in the Old Testament. And that's the kind of imagery employed in Ezekiel 16. Now, in this chapter, you know, sexual sins are described. Okay, Ezekiel 16, 15. I already read that. Ezekiel 16, 25. You built yourself sacred sites and put lofty shrines in every public square. You put them on every street corner and degraded your priceless beauty, opening yourself wide to every man who passed by to add yet another lover. So it's talking about sacred spiritual prostitution. And that was very common in the promised land which Israel occupied. The people occupying the promised land prior to Israel, they were Baal worshippers. And the theology of Baal is, you know, if you sexually excite Baal, you know, Baal will actually sexually excite himself and rain is a semen of Baal. You know, that's gross. That's, that's almost unprintable. But that's, that's what... Uh, Old Testament Bible scholars tell us and that was the theology of the Baal religion which people of Israel got to see every day people of Israel rubbed shoulders with Baal worshippers day in and day out they rubbed shoulders with ba Baal worshippers day in and day out 
So, her sin was sexual. And then, not only that, there's, uh, and what the Word of God says is, if you read verses 28 and 29, 28 and 29 of this chapter, I want you to read this, verse 28 and 29. It's talking about Israel's sexual relationship with a particular nation. And the Word of God says in verse 28, but you were not satisfied. And then Ezekiel 16, 29, it's talking about another sexual relationship. And then the Word of God says, you are not satisfied. You know, somebody said, you will never find in sin what you entered sin to find. Part of, it's packed with a lot of meaning. You will never find in sin what you entered sin to find. Which means that particular sinful pleasure that you are thinking of enjoying and you think this will actually bring a world of pleasure, a bucket full of pleasure, a barrel of pleasure, a ship full of pleasure. But once you reach that point, once you open that website, once you've enjoyed that illicit sexual pleasure, you are feeling empty and it's like as if you drank salt water to quench your thirst. You will never find in sin what you enter is to find. Brad Pitt found it out the other day. The world was talking about Brad Pitt who suffered a divorce with Angelina Jolie, perhaps the most talked about couple in the world. In 2012, apparently Brad Pitt, under the influence of drugs, said, I was hiding out from celebrity thing. I was smoking way too much dope. I was sitting on the couch just turning into a donut and I really got irritated with myself. That's a brilliant imagery. Brad Pitt, one of the highest paid movie actors in this globe, married to one of the most beautiful women on this entire planet. He talked about his life, his life of uh, adultery. In fact, he was still married to his first wife when he was flirting with Angelina Jolie while shooting for Mr. and Mrs. Smith and uh, adultery and drugs. You know, this entire life reduced him to a donut hole. Which means there was a hole in his heart. There was a vacuum in his heart. Just there was a, just like as if there, there's, there is, a, a, you know, there's a donut, there's a hole in a donut. And there was a, and Brad Pitt compared himself to a donut hole. And uh, this passage also talks about the extent of sexual sin. Now I'm going to run through a list of sexual sins in the Bible, but I'm setting you up for that. Uh, Ezekiel 16, 32 to 34 says that Jerusalem would actually have sex. A prostitute will demand payment, but Jerusalem was so sexually immoral, it did not demand sex a payment for sexual immorality. That's the extent to which it rebelled against God through sexual impurity. Ezekiel 16, 32 to 34, we understand that. And not only is that, not only sexual sins, this passage talks about social sins. And uh, Ezekiel 16, 49 and 52, it says, The sin of your rock sister, Sodom, she and her daughters were arrogant, gluttonous, and lazy. She gave help to the poor. She never gave help to the poor and needy. Sodom sin, we all know that. Immediately our mind raises to homosexuality. But you know what? The Bible says Sodom was had, had a sin of no concern for the poor. And verse 52 says, is Jerusalem your worse than Sodom? Which means their sin was not just sexual, it was also social. And thirdly, their sin was spiritual. We talked about it. Ezekiel 16, 20 and 21 and verse 36. You took your sons and daughters, the one you bore me, and slaughtered them, sacrificing your precious children to idols to be consumed. Which means they offered their babies so that through that offer, offer of babies, through that idol worship, they could somehow have a fellowship with that God. Because they are feeling distant from God. And they thought, if I can offer my baby and if that will bring me closer to this God out there, I would do it. So that was the third sin, spiritual sin. Now I'm going to spend a lot of time in the first section. Because we are young people and this is something that we... Uh, this is a subject that is close to our heart, sexual sin. And I want to uh, I want to talk about that. And I, I remember a dad who wanted to talk about sex to his growing up boy. And uh, and his dad said, son, isn't it time that you be talked about how you were born and how babies were born and how you were born and all that. So daddy was feeling really nervous. He was clearing his throat and he was sweat, breaking into a sweat. 
And then this young man looked up his dad and said, looked to his, uh, looked, spoke to his dad and said, sure, dad, what do you want to know? I can tell you. <laughs> sure, dad, what do you want to know? So talking about sex to inform the young people is like uh, teaching a fish to uh, swim, you know? So I, but I will do that, I will do that in the light of God's word. Now the Bible teaches that God created sex for two reasons. One, for procreation. The first command that God gave man was be fruitful and multiply. Genesis 1.28. And that's a command we Indians are pretty good at following because we are all, all at, we are fast accelerating in such a space. Uh, we will one day overcome China to become the most populous country in the world. So we are pretty good at following that command, be fruitful and multiply. But that's one reason why God created sex. And the second reason why God created sex, listen to this very clearly, it is for pleasure inside of marriage. My Bible says in Proverbs 5, 18 and 19, you know, in Proverbs 5, 18 and 19, it's, it's talking about a, a, a young husband and God calls a young husband to enjoy the body of his wife with no holds barred. You know, God says it in black and white. God says it directly. And uh, there is no editing involved in Proverbs 5, 18 and 19. For pleasure inside of marriage. But man started to abuse this great gift of God, sex. When I got married to my wife, July 9th, 2001, and not very far from here, in the town of Gudiatham, you know, 800 people were there for the wedding and people gave us a lot of gifts. And God also walked up to the stage and gave me a gift. Only thing people didn't see it, the video cameras didn't capture it. God gave us a gift and that was a big box and on that box it was written, sex. Later that night, my wife and I unwrapped that gift which God gave us on our wedding day, the gift of sex. But man, you know, abuses this gift of God in a variety of ways. The first way, in fact, the man who first did it in the Bible is called Lamech. Okay, Lamech is the opening batsman. So India is talking about which opening batsman to use. Now, KL Rahul is injured and we have Gautam Gambhir brought into the Indian team after a long time. And uh, we can talk all day about openness. But the opening batsman in the long lineup of batsmen who abuse God's gift of sex is Lamech. And the Bible says in Genesis 4, he told his wife, Ada and Zillah. He had two wives. God created one Adam for one Eve, but Lamech had two wives, Ada and Zillah. And one preacher friend of mine said, Lamech had wives A to Z, A for Ada, Z for Zillah. <laughs> he had wives A to Z. And uh, he began this long, I shouldn't say tradition, it's something that we must repent of, of a wrong, long tradition, or, or wrong, the long thing that is, whatever it is of we abusing God's gift of sex. The first way we abuse God's gift of sex, I'll be quick here. First, by lustful imagination. By lustful imagination. Jesus said in Matthew 5.28, if you look at a woman to lust after her, you already come into the sin of adultery. What Jesus says is, you don't need a bed to come into adultery. All you need is a dirty head. That's what Jesus said. Lustful imagination. The second way we abuse God's gift of sex, by looking at titillation. By looking at titillation or by watching porn. By watching porn. Now, recently, Time Magazine, uh, now I don't have to give you a statistic to show how prevalent this is. That's irrelevant, we all know that. But Time Magazine, in, in its, one of its editions in the month of April this year, talked about different young people who are not believers, but who are who consumed porn with a passion, but they felt that porn is something that they should not be doing and they have come out of it, or they have come out of it and they are wanting the world to follow them. And one such young man is Gabe Dean, 28 year, 28 year old. Porn was part of his adolescence, this article says, as homework or, uh, as homework, you know, as, as part of his life like homework was as he grew up. And it was normal and it was everywhere. And then uh, he also uh, talked about how he quit porn because that was coming in between his, the sexual relationship that he had with his girlfriend. And he talks about how there was no excitement in that relationship because of the influence of porn. And then he knows there will be naysayers who will say, no, 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 that's not because of that. 
And he says, is, why was I not enjoying sex with my girlfriend? Now, this is not a believer, okay? But he's talking about why he quit porn. He says, is it because of inexperience? I've been, no, it's not because of inexperience. I've been sexually active and experienced guy since the age of 14. Is it because of obesity? No, I'm a certified personal trainer with under 10% body fat. Is it because of drug use? I have only, I have smoked about five joints in my entire life. So it's not because of inexperience, it's not because of obesity, it's not because of drug use, it's only because of my porn watching and that is coming in between my enjoying uh, having a normal sexual life and he wanted to quit and he started a website which will help people quit porn watching. What Time Magazine talked about in the April issue, one of its April issues in 2016, this book has been already talking about down through the century, down through the century. In Leviticus chapter 18, the Bible says, 14 times at least, thou shall not uncover the nakedness of, that phrase is used repeatedly. The message of Ezekiel, Leviticus 18 is, the, the husband's nakedness belongs to the eyes of the wife alone, and the wife's nakedness belongs to the eyes of the husband alone. And not only that, uh, in 2 Samuel 11, if you read that story, David took a walk in the balcony and he watched the butt of Bathsheba. David was watching light porn. And the, my Bible says in 2 Samuel 11, 27, the thing that David did displeased the Lord. The thing that David did displeased the Lord. The first thing that David ever did in 2 Samuel 11 was to watch light porn. So that's the second way we abuse God's gift of sex. By watching porn. Thirdly, by lurid conversation. Now, 26 percentage of, of, of people who use smartphones in 2015 in India today poll said that they have sexted. But talking about sexting, I remember one of my Bible heroes. I call him the Mahendra Singh Doni of the Bible, Nehemiah. He had a government job, took a long leave, came to Jerusalem. He rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem with a team. When he was busy with the wall rebuilding work, some people came. Three men came and said, Nehemiah. I want to have, I want to talk to you. We'll have a conference. And what is the venue for this conference? It's not Scott Auditorium. It's the Plains of Ono. And you know what Nehemiah says? If you read Nehemiah chapter 6, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, he says, oh no, I'm not coming to the Plains of Ono to talk to you guys. Now, if this is a guy, and if he can say that to a bunch of guys whom he knows was only there to waste his time, if that's the kind of standard Nehemiah would set, for wasteful conversation with people from the same sex. What kind of standards should we have when we talk to, when we chat with, when we type words with people from the opposite sex? By lurid conversation or by flirty or dirty talk. Fourthly, by how do we abuse God's gift of sex? By let loose body exploration or by pitting or fondling. The world was shocked this new year, the new year that just went by when a bunch of refugees in a town called Cologne in Germany, they entered a New Year's party and they fondled, sexually touched. You know, they, all the women there, the German women there, it became an international news. We still haven't forgotten what the kind of relationship Bill Clinton had, thank you, with Monica Lewinsky. I received an email from a young man. He said, I fell in love with a girl. This is in my email inbox a few, uh, last month. I fell in love with a girl, a believer from the church I attend in my native town. I crossed the limits on her. I just spared, you know, this is exact words. I just spared having an intercourse with her, but I was intimate with her in all the ways I could. Even though I know that it is a sin, I was still doing it. Later things were not working between us, and I felt that this was a relationship, this relationship taken, took me from God took me away from God, I had to break up. And then he talks about how he plays keyboard in the church. Now I'm not talking about issues that some Tom, Dick and Harry who is experiencing walking down the New York City road. I'm talking about issues that you and I face. These are issues that are close to your heart. These are issues that youth who attend churches face. Pitting. Let loose body exploration of pitting and fondling. 
What, words, what does God say? God says in Ezekiel 23, again from the same book we are studying now, but a little, few more chapters later, Ezekiel 23, the Bible talks about Ohala and Ohaliba. God is frank, I will be frank. And God says these women, Ohala and Ohaliba, allowed men to play with their breasts and God calls that act as prostitution. It's there, it's there in Ezekiel 23. That's why I like a break station ad which says, if you can't stop, where do you start? It's a punchline for a break station. If you can't stop, where do you start? The next way we abuse God's gift of sex by lying down and copulation or actually having full-fledged actual sex before marriage. You know, I read a few reviews of the movie Pink. It's literally the talk of India today. Starring Amitabh Bachchan, Tapasvi, Pano. You know, it's, it's a good movie. I believe movies like that have to be made in our time. But the larger message is actually the story of our young people today. It, the message is no, rape is wrong. Yes, rape is wrong, even anybody would know that. But consensual sex, and the, the lead character in the movie is talking about how she had consensual sex with two or three or four people in her life, and that is fine. But this book, which I hold in my hand, in the book of Genesis, talks about Joseph, who had a golden opportunity for consensual sex, but he called it as a great sin against God. It talks about John chapter eight. It talked about Jesus. He, while he did not throw a stone at the woman caught red-handed with adultery, Jesus told the woman, do not sin anymore in this fashion. And uh, our hyper friends would like to tell us that we are no longer under the law so that we can live as we like. I would say that is wrong, that is unscriptural, that is a wrong doctrine, that theology is a piece of rubbish. Because Ezekiel 20 says do not commit adultery. In the New Testament, the writers use some other words. Different, in different words to say the same thing. In Hebrews 13, the Bible says, let your marriage bed be kept pure. That's the same thing as saying, do not come to adultery. The moral laws of the Old Testament are still bounding on us believers. That will not, they will not save us. We are saved by the finished work of the cross. But as believers, we must follow these moral laws enabled by the Holy Spirit. Not just that. How do we abuse God's gift of sex by lesbianism and sodomization or by practicing homosexuality? Jude verse 7 talks about an eternal fire that's coming on the homosexuals, stubborn homosexuals. Do I love homosexuals? Absolutely. Can I give them a bone crushing hug any day? But I will tell them that homosexuality is a sin against God. I don't care what the bishops say. I don't care what the moderator says. This balking bulldog called Duke Gerard will preach this book till there's breath in his nostrils. And this book says homosexuality is a sin. The movie broke back mountain won Oscar, I believe, 2005. It's talking about a married man having a homosexual relationship. But you know what? It doesn't matter. You let the world give awards to broke back mountain. But we need to get back to the Bible and understand the Bible calls homosexuality is a sin. The sixth way we abuse God's gift of sex by lazy sex called sex self stimulation or masturbation. While the Bible never directly addresses the issue of masturbation, uh, it never encourages us to masturbate as if that was a valid option before us. In 1 Corinthians 7, 9, the Bible says, it is better to marry. Notice it doesn't say it is better to masturbate. The Bible says it is better to marry than burn with passion. And uh, if you read the book of Proverbs and if you look elsewhere in the Bible, there are many verses that one is against the sin of laziness. I call masturbation as lazy sex because married people, if you're in this house, you know what I'm talking about. God designed the sex inside of marriage so that it begins with breakfast. You know, sex begins with you greeting your wife, giving her a hug, making a cup of coffee with her, holding her hands, having hours of long conversation. And then as a climax toward the night, you know, sex might happen, might happen, may not happen always. This is a married man speaking, been married for 15 years. It's hard work. Sex inside a man is hard work. But masturbation makes it lazy sex. And the Bible is against laziness. 
Seventhly, how do we abuse God's gift of sex? By lost partner affection or falling in love with unbelievers. You know, the Bible says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. I can, I can talk half an hour about how, why falling in love with an unbeliever is something so foolish. I can tell you about the non-negotiable clause in 1 Corinthians 7.39, where the Bible says you can marry anyone but in the Lord. That's the NNB. I, I, for some time in my life, I was working in uh, the IT company, and uh, I was talking to American customers sitting in Hyderabad. So no matter, even if the American customers abused us with Fs and Bs, we could not put the phone on mute and abuse them back. And if ever they, we did that, in the heat of the moment, our managing director or the CEO can walk into our floor, remove our badge and send us out because that is non-negotiable behavior. Abusing the customer back, even if you put the phone on mute, is non-negotiable behavior. First Corinthians 7.13 says, you can marry anyone, but in the Lord, N and B, non-negotiable. My lost partner, affection. And then, since this involves, this is not directly connected, but it's a new youth issue nevertheless. How do we abuse our body? By licking drinks of fermentation. By licking drinks of fermentation. My Bible says in Proverbs 31 verse 4, the Bible says, you know, it is, it is not for kings or Lemuel to crave wine. And Lemuel is an Old Testament word for consecrated one. So if you are called to be consecrated. And you are called to be holy. You are called to be set apart. You are called to be a Lemuel who should not be craving beer. It will start as a peg. It will graduate into a mug. And then it will become a junk. A licking brings of fermentation. So, sexual sin. And then this book also talks about social sin. You know, it's, it, it, it's talking about how like Sodom, they had no concern for the loss. Is it possible that God handpicked you to join the medical industry and you, as the days rolled, you're falling in love with money and your all-consuming ambition is to make as much money as possible that using the shortest rule, possible. I, I do not know, maybe you, uh, uh, some of the reason why some of us uh, don't love others as much as the word tells us to love them is we hate ourselves. Maybe there, is, there are people here, you're thinking about suicide, you're thinking about getting, can I, can I hang from that ceiling fan? It happens in the IITs. Okay, every now and then, now we hear about how this man, uh, how that student hung himself to death in the hostel. Now, I want to tell you something. Now, God says to each one of you, if you're sitting here with a low self-esteem, maybe that is the root for you not caring for yourself first and also caring for others. I want to tell you, this book says you're fearfully and wonderfully made. This book says in Zechariah chapter 2 verse 8, you're the apple of God's eye. Don't let the devil tell you a lie that you are useless and if you kill yourself, all your problems will get, uh, get over. He's a liar. He's a liar because the Bible says God has placed eternity in your heart. So if you kill yourself, the end will not come. You will still go on living forever and forever and you will stand before Jesus and give an account of yourself. And your soul will live in heaven or hell, depending on what you have done with Jesus. So suicide is no solution. But you know what? Is there genuine concern for the lost? I wish I had time to talk about Jonah. Jonah was so concerned about the shade under his plant. But God sort of told him, Jonah, you're so concerned about the shade of the, your plant. But I'm concerned about the planet. Nineveh has 1,20,000 people. They don't have the left hand from right hand. Should I not be concerned about Nineveh? But you are worried about your plant because the plant dried, you know, died up because of the sun, excessive sun. I am more concerned about millions of people who will go to eternal hell baked by something far more devastating than the sun. Eternal hell! The fire of hell! Should I not be concerned about them?
And then this final thing, and then we'll go into a time of prayer shortly. By long hours of gadget utilization, that is another sin which I believe we must think about. Even I, I thought about it when I read Ezekiel 16. By long hours of gadget utilization. Young people, you might be a believer, you might love Jesus, you may be walking with Jesus for many years, or maybe you never accepted Jesus as the Lord and Savior. But you know what? Ever since you got yourself a smartphone, ever since you got yourself a tablet, do you find yourself many hours, long hours with it? The first thing that happens after you get up is you want to read what, what WhatsApp message that you received. The first thing you want to do shortly after that is you want to find out are there any fresh Facebook notification. You have not thought about your creator who made you. The creator will add another day of your life. And I remember the scripture from Song of Songs 114 where the woman says to the man, take me away from you, let us hurry. No, this is in the context of marriage and I believe one day you'll all get married because this is gonna really affect your marriages. The more addicted you are now as, as a bachelor, as a spinster, it's gonna affect your marriage. You know, this woman says, take me away. You know, take me away from the busyness of life. You know, keep your laptop here. Keep your cell phone here. You know, keep all those gadgets here. Take me away. You know, there we will talk in the open field. I want to be in a place where it's just you and me. For you to have a fulfilling married life, fulfilling family life, get out of these addictions, especially gadget addiction. Now, I talked about a lot of sins, about 10, uh, 10 11 sins. I, uh, you, you have followed me uh, now, but this, as I bring this, end, this message to an end, I want you to look at Ezekiel 16, 26, 40, 41, 43, 45, 49. 26, 40, 41, 43, 59. I want you to read Ezekiel 16. Now, when you read those verses, you'll understand that there are consequences for sin. There are consequences. Ezekiel 16, 26. Then you started warring with your well-endowed Egyptian neighbors, and I, be and you became, I became more and more angry with your escalating promiscuity. So God doesn't wink at our sin. Even if you're a believer, if you're in Christ, even now, God doesn't wink at your sin. Ephesians 4.30, the Bible says, Ephesians 4.30, 29 and 30, it says, the Holy Spirit is grieved and God is angry. That's the story of the entire Bible. And then, uh, ultimately, if we are still stubborn and stuck on our sin, the Bible teaches, we will go to an eternal place called hell. David Pawson, a Bible teacher whom I love and respect, pointed out that of the many times that Jesus preached about hell, he preached it to his disciples. In fact, he preached about hell once before giving them a missionary commission. So this is a mission conference. And Jesus told his missionary candidates, he's talking about hell. Don't be afraid of people who will kill your body and do, can do nothing about your soul. Fear him who can destroy your body and soul in hell. So that's going to be the ultimate destination. As I said, a living hell. A living hell. You know, uh, watching porn destroys your peace. Having pride, you know, upsets you in some way. Sin, no matter how attractively packaged, even if we enjoy it for a fleeting few seconds. As the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 11.25, the fleeting pleasures of sin. So it's there and it's not there. And there's a gaping dotted hole, as Brad Pitt called it. It's a living hell and a little hell. Living hell taking you to a little hell. So what should you do? Three things. First, our first speaker talked about it. I appreciate all what he shared, especially financial repentance and other things. Talked about repentance. The first thing is to repent, leave, as I call it. Another passage, I told you there are 100 passages like Ezekiel 16 in the Bible, talking about relating sin to adultery, sin to whoredom, sin to prostitution, about 100 passages in the Old Testament. Another passage is Hosea chapter 3, the message of Hosea is very exciting. It says, God says to you, even if you go to the red light, that will not put a red light on my love for you. 
Even if you go to the red light area and be a prostitute, I'm not going to put a red light on my love for you. But that doesn't mean you can stay doing that, keep doing that. You need to take a turn around. That's the message of Hosea chapter 3. Hosea tells his prostitute wife, you must stop your prostitution. That's the first thing God wants us to do. Repent. Leave. The second thing, believe. Like Rahab the prostitute by faith, put the Put her faith in the living God. We must believe in Jesus. Put our faith in Jesus who hung on the cross. You know, in uh, Ezekiel 16, and I think it's verse 16, it's talking about a new covenant. A new covenant. And, and the new covenant is the gospel of Jesus. Jesus who came. Jesus, you know, when Jesus bent down and those Roman soldiers whipped him on his back. Uh, according to the new covenant, uh, Duke Gerard should be whipped. Uh, you can put your name. You should be whipped because you... Well, sinned against Jesus with your body. You were sexually immoral. And in your body, there was pride. And there was arrogance. And, uh, and no concern for others. All those sins were in that body. But Jesus took my place on the cross of Calvary. That's the new covenant which, you know, uh, Ezekiel 16 predicts. 1660. We must put our faith in him. Faith in Jesus. Now the world is talking about the longest and the tallest bridge in China. I, if I read it right, it says that around 800 people can go over that, uh, over that bridge. It is a completely glass bridge. Uh, SUV, uh, Volvo XC900 SUV, a big car went over it. And some engineers you know, tried to uh, put a lot of weights on it and those, that bridge did not give, uh, give away. Huge bridge. And then on the top of the bridge, you can see the, the view is breathtaking. Almost 1,000 feet below. You can see breathtaking beauty. It's one of the world's present, the number one world tourist attraction. You know what? If you somebody gave you a chance to go there, uh, you would walk in that bridge, and if you are standing in the center, you will not be thinking, okay, this bridge can take 800 people. But when I'm in the center, will they allow the 800 and first one? If I'm in the center, will they allow the 800 and first and the second and third, and will this bridge collapse? Will this glass bridge, glass bridge collapse? You know what? We have faith instinctively for the things of the world. But as we went to medical colleges, we learned about all these theories and we think, you know, we have a lot of uh, analytical knowledge. You know, we start to question everything. Now, I want to tell you something. You now, uh, my subject is not apologetics, but I want to tell you something. Jesus Christ came down, lived a sinless life, died on the cross, rose again from the, wind, uh, rose again from the dead, and today is calling you. And there is... The, the, you know, if you would study Jesus with an apologetic eye, there is enough proof to put your faith in Jesus. Put your faith in Jesus and live for him in the one life that you have. And that's what I'm going to invite you to do now. And finally, leave, believe, and cleave. I go to the book of Revelation 14, where the Bible is talking about 144,000. I believe the, a good way to interpret 144,000 is it to say that uh, the Old Testament people of God and the New Testament people of God. Twelve, the old, uh, the Israel has twelve tribes. Uh, old Testament, we read about twelve tribes. And uh, twelve, in the New Testament, Jesus had twelve disciples, symbolic of the New Testament people of God. Uh, twelve from the Old Testament, twelve from the New Testament, thousand, a large number, a large number. But still a minority, because we have billions of people in this world. A large number of people from the uh, Old Testament and the New Testament, all the people of God, down through the centuries, they will be in heaven one day. Revelation 14, 3, 4, 11. They are the 144,000. But what is their hallmark? If you read Revelation 14, 4, and the Bible clearly says, and that's why I like the theme for this camp, which is, come follow me. It says, they are the people who follow the Lamb wherever He went. So young people, I'm not... Looking for somebody to just raise their hand, make a commitment, and forget about it. I'm talking about a lifetime of following the Lamb. The message of Revelation 14, according to me, is you be disciple or you be damned. Be willing to be a disciple of Jesus or be damned, because verse 11 talks about hell. Revelation 14:11 talks about hell, which means uh, the context of Revelation is that people. Those persecution and people, uh, you have to be serious about being a following Christ, following the Lamb wherever He goes. If you're not serious, if you deny Jesus in a public forum, and if you live in sin, and your faith doesn't persevere, if your faith doesn't endure, then hell can be your destination. Believe, leave, believe, and cleave. I want you to close your eyes. All eyes closed, all heads bowed.
The next five to seven minutes could be the most important five to seven minutes of your life. How many person? I, you, I don't know who you are. You, you may be a person just hearing about Jesus, or you're mocked with Jesus for many years. How many of you would say that right now, I want to rededicate my life to Jesus. I want to turn from my sin. Yes, as I read Ezekiel 16, there are some sins which Ezekiel 16 talks about in my life. And even as you heard this message, the Holy Spirit perhaps spoke to you about some of the things in your life. You're hearing the voice, repent. Jesus said, unless you repent, you too will perish. <coughs> unless you repent, you too will perish. Perish is another Bible word for hell. Are you ready to turn from sin and believe in Jesus who died for you on the cross? Have it in your heart. And not just believe, but clean. Would you follow Jesus with a, with a view of a lifetime of following Jesus wherever he takes you? He might take you to that village. Now I know this is not my topic at all, but I'm going to say this because the Holy Spirit is guiding me in this. He will, you will follow the Lamb wherever he goes. He might take you into a small village and ask you to start a clinic there. If it is his will for you to do that. Do you follow him there? To do some medical work in a small village if the Lamb leads you to some place. He may not always lead you to America. I'm sure of that. I'm sure, pretty sure of that. He's not going to lead all of us to America. Definitely not. But he might lead you somewhere where there's a need, great need. Would you be, would you be willing to obey? Would you be willing to obey? Believe, leave, believe and cleave. If you're willing to do that, I want you to raise your hands. Raise it high. Raise it high. Raise it high. Don't be ashamed. I want you to do a second thing quickly. I want you to get up from your seats. If you raise that hand, get up from your seats. Raise that hand. Not everybody, not everybody. If you made a specific commitment, if you made a specific commitment, I want you to get up. To leave, believe, and cleave. Third point is very, very important. Third, third point is very, very important. Cleave, follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Revelation 14, 4. And the fourth thing, I, I want you to do this quickly, and I want you to show the speed of an Usain Bolt. I want you to come to the altar quickly. Come down. I can wait for those in the those at the uh, those at the front, uh, those in the balcony. Uh, I want you to come to the front. Come to the front. Come to the front quickly, and we'll spend another two or three minutes in prayer maximum. Come down. Come to the altar right now. Come to the altar without wasting time. Come. We'll wait for you. We'll wait for you. I don't want anybody talking. This is a solemn moment. And as you have come, I want you to do the fourth thing. I want you to kneel down. I want you to kneel down in God's presence. I want you to kneel down in God's presence. And as you're kneeling down, the Holy Spirit will direct you as to what you're doing. Some of you need to turn away from sin. Say, Lord, I'm sorry. Say, the Lord, I'm sorry. Now, some of you need to. Uh, some of you need to say, Lord, I'm not following you wherever you lead me. My plans for my life, my dreams for my life, my ambition for my life. No, that's dominating me. I'm repenting of that. I'm not following the Lamb wherever He goes. No, whatever the Lord asks you to do, I want you to bring it to Him in prayer. I want you to bring it to Him in prayer. Right now. Right now. This is a precious, these are, these are precious two or three minutes that you will have with the Lord. Lord, I'm sorry. My Bible says the blood of Jesus will cleanse you from every sin. The blood of Jesus will cleanse you from every sin. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. The Bible says in Isaiah 118. Your sin may be unprintable, but if you come to Jesus, and Jesus, and you say, Lord, I'm sorry, he will wash your sin, no matter what that sin is. It may be sexual, social, spiritual. Right now, he'll wash you. And he lead your life to him, 100 percent. No holding back. Heal it, 100 percent, right now. And tell him, Lord, I will follow the Lamb wherever the Lamb takes me. I do not know what I what I will do after finishing this college, finishing my course here in that particular medical college. But wherever you lead me, I will go because. 
you have given me a privilege to study this particular degree. And wherever you need me, I will go. It's not about my ambition, it's not about money, but it's about what you want me to do. And among those of you kneeling, if you're making a commitment to follow Jesus for the first time, I want you to pray with me and, and, and I will finish with that. Shall we pray? Would you repeat this prayer after me? Would you repeat this prayer after me? Those of you who have never made a commitment to Jesus or those of you who want to come back to Jesus, uh, would you pray with me? Dear Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for my sins. Please wash me. Cleanse me with your blood. Thank you for dying for me on the cross. I yield myself to you. From this day onwards, I'm yours. I will follow your lead. You are my captain. You are my Lord. You are my only Savior. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for washing me. Thank you for cleansing me. In your name I ask. Amen.